Chemistry lecture number 26, shape of the S, P, D, and F orbitals. Early models of the atom stated that electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbiting the sun. This model is not correct. Electrons do not move around the nucleus in nice circular paths. In fact, they move in random paths around the nucleus. Now, why do electrons move in random paths? Uh, it has to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, this states that you cannot know both the position and velocity of an object at the same time. Uh, the velocity of an object is its speed and its direction. Now, suppose you shoot uh, electrons through a hole in the wall. Uh, the electrons pass through and hit a second wall. And we're going to assume that we know the speed and direction of the electrons before it goes through that hole. If the hole is big, the electrons will just move straight through the hole. So, here's our picture. We've got our electron moving through a big hole uh, in the uh, wall, and then it hits a second wall. Okay. Now suppose a friend with an active imagination, uh, with a very active imagination says to you, uh, I know the electron passed through that big gap and went to the other side, uh, but what happened when the electron entered the gap? And maybe it's possible that the electron started bouncing up and down, left and right, and then left the gap. So what this uh, friend is suggesting is that uh, when the electron went through, once it reached the gap, since we can't see it, it may have started bouncing up and down or moving all around and then... Uh, continued its path, and maybe it moved here and then went like that. Um, so that's a pretty imaginative thing, but uh, you reply, on the other hand, um, you're crazy. Okay? Uh, you can draw a straight line from where the electron started to where it ended up. All right. So he's saying that the electron, when it entered the gap, may have gone through here and bounced up and down. Um, but we don't know where the electron was when it entered the gap. It could have been anywhere along here in the gap. And you reply, but you can draw a straight line from where the electron started to where it ended up. See, it started here, ended here. You can just draw a straight line. So uh, your argument is that uh, we have to know that when it entered the gap, it was right here. But your friend's saying, no, no, you didn't see what it was doing. It could have been bouncing around. All right, so what you do is you say, uh, just to prove that you can pinpoint uh, the location while it's in the gap, we'll narrow the gap and make it smaller. So we're going to prove that the electron was not uh, bouncing all around here. We're just going to make it more narrow, and if we get the same result, we know that the uh, electron uh, was probably where we think it is. All right, so you narrow the gap and shoot electrons through it, and this is what happens. <clears throat> so we narrow the gap a bit, and then when the electron goes through, some of them go straight, but then you notice that some of the electrons don't go straight. They seem to deviate from the straight line path that we had when we had the big gap. All right, so if it's a big gap, it seems to go straight, but then when we narrow the gap, the electron seems to change direction. Hmm. So instead of landing in one spot, the electrons appear to have changed direction while they were in the gap and landed at different locations. And the region where they've landed is spread out now. All right. So before it was just landing in this region here. Now we've got a larger region where the electrons are landing. All right, so then we decide to make the gap even smaller. So here's what happens when we make the uh, gap even smaller and the electrons are shot through this even more narrow gap. So some of the electrons pass straight through, but as in the previous example, some of them deviate and we're getting even more deviation from the original direction. So the more narrow we make the gap, the more likely it is the electrons are going to change direction uh, and the more narrow it is, it, the greater the probability that it's going to change its direction by a, a wider degree. Okay. We see that the electrons spread out even more when the gap gets smaller. 
excuse me, so the smaller the gap, or the more we know about the electron's location, the less we know about the direction it takes, or its velocity. All right, so remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says we can't know both its position and velocity at the same time, and this illustrates it. The smaller the gap, the more we know about its position, uh, but the less we know about the velocity or the direction it's going to take. Okay. Now conversely, when the gap is wide, uh, we know less about the electron's position, but we are, it is more likely to keep uh, the same direction or velocity, which means we know more about its velocity. So, wide gap, we don't know as much about its position, but we do know its direction or velocity. So you trade one off for the other. Big gap, you know the velocity. Narrow gap, um, you know its position, but then you lose uh, the ability to predict its uh, direction or its velocity. Now, although we cannot predict the direction an electron will take when it passes through a narrow gap, uh, we can predict the probability that it will move in a certain direction. Photons also behave like electrons when passing through a narrow gap. And the next diagram shows the distribution of photons through the narrow gap. Uh, most of the photons will go straight, a smaller number will move left and right, and an even smaller number will go further left and right. So, it's kind of a blurry picture, but anyway. So, most of the photons are going to land in this central region. And this hump shows relatively... Um, how many photons are going to land in this region. Most of them are going to land in the middle, that's why this is at a peak, and then as you move uh, away from the central peak, the probability that it will land there goes down. But then some of the photons land here, and this size of this hump shows the probability it's going to land in this area. Anyway, we can't predict which ones will go straight, left or right, but we know the percentage that will take a certain direction. So we know that a certain percentage are going to go in this region, a certain percentage are going to go in this region. So out of 100 photons, you know, 60 of them are going to go here, and then 20 of them will go here and here, and so on. All right, now the next picture shows the light pattern made when photons pass through a narrow gap or slit. So this matches what we see here, what's actually happening, I can make it a little bit more clear, is here is the central location where most of the photons show up, and that's the corresponding picture. All right, So most of the photons are going to land in the center. So you see this bright band of light? That's because that's where most of the photons are showing up. And then a smaller number will go here and here, and so on. And then and just reorient it like this. So this shows the probability that a photon is going to go to the left or to the right. Most of them go into the center. And sort of the height of these little things here shows the probability that it will land at these certain locations. So notice most of the photons went straight to the center and the number of photons that go left or right decreases as you move further from the center. So the further you go from the center, the less likely it is that the photons are going to land uh, left or right as you go further left and right. <clears throat> Thus, when placed in a confined space, we can predict the likelihood that a photon or an electron will move in a certain direction. Now, why does the electron choose a certain direction? Um, why would it go left instead of right? We don't know. Uh, the best we can do is predict the likelihood that it will choose a certain direction. And this bothered Albert Einstein, who said, God does not play dice with the cosmos. He didn't like the idea that the photons, when they reached a gap, would sort of throw some dice and say, okay, if it's a seven, I'll go straight, and if it's a four or a two or a six, I'll go left or right. Uh, that's what the photons seem to be behaving like. Uh, they seem to be behaving like random dice that would randomly pick a direction. And uh, this sort of undermined the idea that uh, you can explain everything uh, of why it would go left or right. But uh, apparently that's not what electrons and photons do. And in fact, physicist Niels Bohr responded by saying something like, stop telling God what to do. Um, anyway, an electron moving within the uh, tiny confined space of an atom will move in a random direction, uh, so we'll never know exactly where it's located. Uh, we can, however, express the probability of finding the electron at a certain location. 
In fact, S, P, D, and F energy levels have specific shapes that show where the electron is likely to be found. Okay, quick review. Remember, S sublevel has one orbital, P has three orbitals, D has five, and F has seven. The S orbital is shaped like a sphere that surrounds the nucleus. Uh, this means that the electron can be found within the region of the sphere. Okay, so there's your shape of the uh, S orbital. So the S orbital is a sphere, and the electrons are just moving within the sphere. And in the middle of the sphere is the nucleus of the atom. And the electron is just sort of randomly moving around in this spherical region. Okay. The P orbital is shaped like a dumbbell. And the P sublevel has three orbitals, so there are three orientations for the P orbitals. Okay, so that's the shape, and then this shape can either be coming towards you, it can be left or right, or it can be up or down. So that's the shape and orientation of the P orbitals. The D sublevel has five orbitals, so there are five orientations for the D orbital. And these are the shapes of the d orbital. So the d orbitals all have the same shape except for the last one which looks like a p orbital with a donut around it. Anyway, five uh, orbitals, so five orientations or shapes. The f sublevel has seven orbitals, so it has seven shapes. And those are the seven shapes and orientations of the f orbitals. These are real weird ones. It's got that dumbbell shape with two donuts around it. All right, so for our PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 26, shape of the S, P, D, and F orbitals.